Hi, and welcome to episode 10 of The Focus. I'm Oldu Rol. I'm Horia Sloshansky. Welcome. So today we're uh, concluding the uh, sharing uh, of the balances or on our galaxy view and the last two um, dimensions that we're going to be looking at is around safety and courage. Um, and we will from um, from from here on on we are going to look on look to our listener community and anybody that feels they can contribute to actually expand this body of knowledge from what we have shared up to now. Um, so jumping right in there um, from uh, uh, get, getting into the business of this, Horia, um, let's talk a little bit about safety and courage and why did we actually pick this polarity as something that's important to balance? Yeah, safety is foundational. Uh, think of it this way. If we are to make any improvements in the world around us, we need um, to confront the areas where things don't go as well as they could. Because if we leave them be as they are, things aren't going to get better. Um, so in order to really notice opportunities for improvement, we need to call out observations. And um, when our work is not just solo, uh, in other words, I'm observing for myself and I'm working with some people and I observe opportunities for others, that's where we might have some difficulty because I notice something, hey, uh, that plate is dirty. Uh, would you mind put it again in the, in the dishwasher? Um, the person that you're addressing that observation might take it as an affront. Uh, who do you think you are? pointing out that the plate is dirty. Who do you think you are? Um, uh, don't you know who I am? I don't sully my hands uh, putting plates. So that's uh, somebody else's job and so on. So you can get into difficulty quite easily um, as uh, ego can um, cloud the issue. We can have uh, various community or uh, tribal um, habits that conflict with the observations. We may self-censor, say, well, I'm not gonna say anything about that because, hey, uh, people may react unpleasantly when uh, it's unsafe to speak, unsafe to, um, to challenge because there's great temptation to retaliate. Um, you uh, say something, oh, I'm being attacked, boom, boom, let me show you what attack looks like, right? And then that just, escalates and, and makes things worse. Now, retaliation can have many shapes. It can be ostracism. No, no, that person isn't one of us. Um, we will um, ignore them. We will cancel them. We will uh, kick them out of um, our community. Uh, the, tribe might, uh, has, the tribe has spoken. That's right. Yes. Um, there may be um, sabotage. Uh, there may be uh, all forms of uh, verbal and physical violence. There's the whole um, spectrum there. Now, safety is absolutely essential for ensuring we can actually communicate well and, and notice what is worth improving. Um, how do we make it so that we practice the courage to do less self-censoring? How do we build the courage of um, speaking up? Because courage and safety need to go hand in hand. If I'm so courageous, I say something and then, hey, <clears throat> some people take offense to it and make a big fuss. Oh, and then start calling people names. You are uh, this or a that or a whatever uh, flavor you prefer, an anti this or an anti that. Doesn't really matter. What matters is we're eroding the practice of dialogue. We're eroding the practice of noticing what is worth improving when we're making things unsafe. And um, <laughs> Um, uh, paradoxically, if we're attempting to make things too safe, you know, in other words, um, for the sake of safety, 
we are not allowed to even mention such and such. Because if we mention it, we might trigger uh, people's sense of, um, of, of self and um, they might be um, upset and offended. So therefore we shouldn't say such and such a word or we shouldn't uh, approach such and such a subject. Uh, whoops, we have difficulties. And already we see in the culture around us all sorts of special words that only some people can say and others cannot, uh, some special topics that some people can address and others cannot, uh, and uh, certain uh, topics that um, unfortunately many um, people now are almost um, through legislation being forced into um, embracing or adopting. It's, it's very, very fascinating. So how do we so, get balance and courage? So some of that includes uh, what you've alluded to, uh, includes censorship. Um, mm. That just closes down any um, transparency and debate um, on, on topical issues uh, of the day. Um, so we've seen quite a lot of that. Um, the camps calling um, each other names, um, accusing each other of false information sharing and mm scaremongering and all sorts of different things so th this is all fact facets of this safety courage uh, dimension that um that that we're exploring one of the uh, examples that i've seen this in action um i have helped an organization that um works um like a semi um, military organization it's not the new zealand military i have to just say that <laughs> But I've worked with an organization that um, uh, it became very apparent that the people with the higher ranks in the room did not really provide safety um, for the lower ranks in the room when certain issues had to be discussed. It was quite fascinating to see how even just something as rank is e easily influences this uh, balance between safety and courage. Um, and when do people do have, when people had the, the courage to speak up on certain things, um, I saw all sorts of interesting behaviors um, from the higher ranking um, people in, in that situation. It was fascinating to observe. And I'm sure that it's not necessarily just in semi-militaristic -milit organizations. You get aspects of this in, in many different uh, types of hierarchies uh, in, in organizations. Um, Horia, any war stories uh, that you can just share without naming names, of course, um, that, that you've seen this uh, at play? Well, um, let me uh, give an example of, um, of safety done well. So um, in a large um, organization, well, by New Zealand standards anyway, um, the executive leadership didn't do a particularly um, effective job. And therefore, the board of directors essentially released the executives from their contracts and brought in new um, specialists. And some of these new specialists had uh, a really deep understanding of lean and agile ways of thinking and embraced those habits and practiced them really well. And as a result, um, they uh, could then actively invite challenge to their perspective. So they invited um, a, a range of, of really um, world-class change agents and, and facilitators. And as a result, um, not only did they invite this um, expertise, they actually then listened. They actually then asked, so what are we missing? Um, we're planning on doing this, this, and this. Um, how can we make this better? What do you think? Yeah. So rather than uh, dictating and saying, it must be done this way, it will be this, they had the wisdom and the humility to say, look, here's what we want to have happen. What do you think we're missing? How can we make this even better? So when you have this blend of insight 
and say, you know what, this is not a solo gig. It's not about me, the glorious leader, to set the path and make sure that everybody does what I tell them to. I can actually engage the community that uh, I have in my care to define what is achievable, what is doable, then we can actually uh, get somewhere. So then you have people that, um, some of their colleagues that weren't quite sold on this approach gradually made a, a transition by noticing the impact and the effectiveness that this brings. And you have people saying to you then, wow, you know what, it looks like you're my conscience. Because <laughs> you help people to stop doing things that previously they know nah, they shouldn't have been doing that. But now that you see a new and different and better way of doing it, you go, you know what? I don't have to betray myself. I don't have to sell my soul anymore. I can actually do better. I can be courageous and push back and say, you know what? No, we're not doing that. We're doing this. And hey, not only doing that is better, for the organization, it's better for yourself, it's better for everybody involved. So that when you have this balance of, of courage and safety done well, you get really impactful uh, changes. There seems to be quite a strong undertone of the example that you've shared from intent-based leadership uh, mm. uh, uh, principles and, and practices uh, out there, but we'll cover some of that a little bit later. Um, jumping straight into uh, just to remind you how we're going to step through this is, first of all, we are going to look at what are the downsides of having uh, of, of uh, safety. So what are the current struggle patterns when we over focus on just safety? Then we'll go to the desired outcomes of courage. So what are the benefits? Um, what are the positive results from the from having courage in your context then we'll go to look at what are the downsides when we overcorrect on on courage or whether we have, what the negative results may be when we over focus on courage then we'll focus on what's the benefits to be retained from um, safety what's the positive results from having that uh, uh, consideration then at number five there, we'll look at what are the overall purpose. What does life look like when we've got balance between courage and safety in, in your context? And then we'll look at what's the double down? What's the, the deepest fears that both sides of this polarity is trying to avoid? Then we will focus on actions and skills. So what are the things that you can do or consider to keep uh, above this, this uh, axis uh, and not let it drop down into the, the double downs. And then we'll look at what are some of the observable, measurable indicators or early warning signs that you can look out for to note it, to uh, identify whether one or both of these um, balances are slipping back into the, the fears space. And I'm going to jump straight into the first one. And we're going to look at what are the struggle patterns that's got to do with excessive um, courage. So uh, excessive safety, sorry about that. Or um, what are the, the downside on safety? So um, we all have heard, or if you have not, there's quite a lot written um, about psychological safety especially after it's been published by the uh, Google research on the Aristotle project. Um, but there's quite a lot of new thinking in, term, in the psychological safety space. But the first thing that, uh, we, un that we see are um, behaviors that contribute to an unsafe culture. So we'll see bullying, passive aggressiveness, we'll see um, uh, the centers being ostracized. So really not be, people not feeling safe to speak up and speak their mind. And sometimes a really good place to pick that up is listening to what's being said in retrospectives. Sometimes what's not being said is, is actually speaks a lot louder than what is actually being said. 
when you listen to and, and, and sitting on retrospectives. There may be uh, uh, elements of backstabbing, um, uh, G -G Game of Thrones type, Hunger Games, uh, Survivor type mentality. Um, I have seen one or two projects that, um, that does operate like that in my career. And I must say, I not, don't look back on it with fondness. You'll see lots of blame, uh, blame personship, et cetera. So these are all types of behaviors that um, builds an unsafe culture. What we also noticed uh, with the panel is, is that the certain misbehaviors are enabled. So if you think in terms of how people are incentivized, for instance, um, they are incentivized to display a specific behavior that's harmful to the organization or to uh, people that's not so powerful in the organization. Um, you'll see also um, there's no or very little whistleblowing or when it is, when it gets to uh, a, a type of situation like that, shooting the messenger. Um, this organizational amnesia is something <laughs> that you must probably smile about because it's like we came up with this wonderful idea and then uh, six months later we came up with the same wonderful idea. Um, it's like or you forgot um, the lessons that you've learned in the past um, because it wasn't safe to remember or even remind others of the lessons that we have learned about things. Look at um, uh, liberal, uh, too much uh, liberal, liberalism um, uh, uh, in decision-making. Um, there are things like um, rumors being spread. Um, so have a look at what are the types of misbehaviors that is enabled with the absence of safety. There's also a sense of numbness um, to look out for. Um, there's a, a no pressure when you don't deliver. There's no consequences of non, for non-delivery. Um, I have worked in an organization um, for a while, and it was pretty obvious that whether people did or didn't, there was no consequences. So very little things actually got done on the taxpayer's uh, dime, and um, it was really just numb, walking in, doing, being there all day. It just numbs. It's, uh, it's quite interesting. The other side of numbness has also got to do with exhaustion from change or change fatigue. Um, it's too, there's too much happening and it's not paced. So people are just totally numb. They've, they've resigned inwardly and just plod on. They just going, going on and just going through the motions as well. And there's a note there, the larger the mortgage, the quieter they are. So those who've got the most to lose would tend to be afraid to speak up. So for as an agile coach, when you're actually working in, working for an organization and as an internal employee, sometimes there is a blocker that you potentially may have to deal with in your own coaching by, be not, by not being willing or able to call out things. Look out for those closed fixed mindsets. Uh, those aversion to risk, um, their uh, uh, <laughs> psychopaths rise in management. This is not to say that all managers are psychopaths, but we do see in certain types of organizations, especially when you look at the uh, LALU model, the, the ones uh, moving towards the red uh, type organizations usually have a higher <laughs> incidence of psychopaths. Um, Again, just a disclaimer, not all managers are psychopaths. Just um, please um, quote me on that. Um, okay. Uh, also, um, uh, a, a fear of learning. Uh, that's part of this fixed mindset or closed mindset. There's also a, lo uh, a lot of things associated with triggers. Um, and any incident can trigger people in, in different ways. And when it's an unsafe environment, look out what the triggers does uh, in uh, for, for different people. Some may just jump immediately to panic and then blame others. Um, 
look out there for red language. Um, what we mean by that is just work, 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 work language and no language or intention to stand back and look at the big picture and look what's going on in order to see um, what could be cause and effects up and down a value stream, for instance. Um, you also notice that the oversight function specifically tend to operate in panic mode mostly. Um, and that, that's another sign of uh, safety in that environment not being a high priority. Um, look at the when you uh, get people to move out of the comfort zones that they're in. Um, look a little bit about how they behave when they're outside those comfort zones. It will tell you quite a lot about the safety in that um, organization. Look out for blind spots that's either not acknowledged or people just stick their head in the sand, ignore it, pretend it's not there. Um, so there's lots of that types of things going on as well when it comes to low safety. And I'm pretty sure that we may have missed some things. Um, by all means, uh, contact us, uh, come talk to us about what, what, what else do we can we add here? Have you got some good stories about this? Come share it with us. Now that we've looked at the downside of safety, let's have a look at what are the benefits? What are the desired outcomes when we look at having courageous people? Or yeah. mm. When we practice courage effectively, it means that we're pushing the boundaries of communication to a point where we're changing our perspective if i say something courageous that is intended to create safety why because if i keep quiet and i'm not speaking up with courage something undesirable is going to happen whereas if i muster the courage if I overcome my fear and I speak up, I speak up with the intention of making things better, of making things safer. So when we practice courageous speaking, we do so with an idea of challenging each other so that we achieve better. We want to celebrate and reward courage. We want to make it so that community and connection is rewarded. We want to make it so that when people display competence and intelligence, we don't respond with resentment to that, but instead we have the courage to confront our own weaknesses and draw inspiration rather than work in a retaliatory fashion to that. So uh, courage has a range of really deep impacts both on the self and on the community. So fundamentally, it has to be about making things safe. If I am courageous or I claim to be courageous, but my intention is not really one of improving our connection in our community, then that's not really courage. It's mislabeled courage. I'm just being obnoxious. I'm calling things out with the intention of diminishing people, of shaming people, of pouncing on their weaknesses and, uh, and, and crushing them. Well, that's not courage. That's bullying. Yeah? So let's be clear about definition of terms here. Courage is the practice of speech with the intention of improving things together. Yeah. Now, this is why we notice that well-practiced courage leads to an integrated focus on value. In other words, we engage in calculated uh, risk-taking and um, we can ask ourselves, why shouldn't we be curious? 
about making things better. Yeah? So rather than uh, default to no, we say, no, 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 no. As soon as a challenge comes in, we have instead a focus on Kaizen, on always striving to make things better. And again, that requires courage. That requires the courage to engage in disciplined practice, to wake up in the morning and say, ha ha, we're going to make the day even better. But that requires effort. That requires discipline. That, re that requires getting after it, getting on the path getting better every day, doing something that, ah, as some people in the um, uh, military traditions call, embrace the suck, embrace the suffering. Yeah, there has to be some suffering. And it's very interesting. Uh, recent um, neuroscience research shows that it's tremendously important to voluntarily place yourself uh, in that kind of discipline, because then it brings a whole lot of health benefits as well. Now, transparency. Courage is intended to shift awareness, to build mutual trust, to share, to notice what is actually going on, what is happening. And therefore, we build clarity around what is actually going on rather than keeping things obscure. Who benefits from keeping things obscure? Well, people that want to engage in activities and practices that are uh, dubious to nefarious. And if somebody courageously challenges them, hey, 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 what, what gives? Well, why are you doing that? Hold on a second, that, that's, that's not right, that's not fair, that's not appropriate. If you challenge with courage, then transparency develops and therefore it acts as a break on behavior that is intended to harm others. So therefore, through a good practice of courage, we can have more clarity. Now that also um, brings us to the great opportunity when we practice courage well, we can actually develop this exhilaration, this sense of, of joy, there, there's something so powerful in doing something inventive together. Yay, we got this. Yay, we overcame this difficulty. Yay, it seemed like a ridiculous thing to ask of us. And yet, look, we were clever. We figured out a way. And hey, wow, we did it. Yeah. I've seen examples of this, and it's just a joy uh, to, to see how people can get into work and do really great things. And then, whew, it's just amazing. Yeah? Everybody wins. It can be done. And you want to do that as you go, right? So um, we'll give some examples later on when we come and describe the... Um, skills and, and activities around this. And finally, uh, to close the desired outcomes of, of courage practice, well, think of the willingness to take the consequences of courageous action. In other words, you know, when you're practicing action or speech with courage, that you may get in trouble. Yeah, because otherwise, where's the courage? Yeah, if there's no trepidation in speaking with courage, then it wasn't really courageous. It was just speech or action. Yeah? So therefore, courage requires a degree of, of risk, a degree of personal risk, a degree of career risk, a degree of intellectual and moral risk. Yeah? And that's where trust is essential. And that's why courage needs to be balanced with, with safety. In other words, when somebody speaks with courage, if there's zero tolerance for courageous action, then we're in trouble. Because there's pretty soon nobody's going to dare practice any courage because things are unsafe. As soon as you've raised your head over the parapet and said something, smack. The, yeah, it's known as a tall poppy syndrome. Oh, tall poppy syndrome. Uh, my mind went to the um, 
NKVD or the KGB or the FSB kind of coming in and grabbing you in the middle of the night and off you go to Siberia and you're never heard of again. Yeah, that has happened and it still happens in some parts of the world, unfortunately, um, when people courageously uh, protest, it might have unsafe consequences. Yeah. So uh, willing to be a pioneer, willing to risk ridicule, um, having a comfort, being sufficiently comfortable at being, shall we say, somewhat disagreeable. Yeah, this is a, a personality tra uh, trait um, out of the big five, so agreeableness. Um, the challenge is we cannot afford to be completely disagreeable. In other words, whatever you say, I'm going to resist it, just on principle, just because you said it. Yeah, that the disagreeableness doesn't get us anywhere. We can't collaborate. We can't do anything together if whatever you go, yes, I go, no. Whatever you go, black, I go, white. There has to be some form of blend, some form of harmony. So we have to find some agreement. But the point is, if I'm becoming too agreeable to whatever it is that you say, then we don't have any challenge, any validation that what you're suggesting is actually a good thing to do. So we need to challenge each other to discover, yeah, is this still in balance? Is, still, is this still a good thing? And not just for you, but for me as well, and hopefully for a lot of others also. So this building of reality together, testing of what is truly good and valuable together, that's essential. And that's what uh, this is all about in terms of the necessity of practicing courage, the necessity of teaching each other courage, the necessity of demonstrating and then imitating courage. But again, let me remind us of the, our intent. Courage is that action and that speech that it is intending to achieve a better outcome for all of us, not just for some of us, but for all of us. How do we make our collaboration, how do we make our community better, stronger, more resilient, more effective? If it's not, then we may have some difficulty. That's not really courage then, it's something else. So what happens if we overcorrect and we go a little bit overboard with courage? So when we explored this, um, there were excessive courage or not enough courage. Um, that, that's quite um, visible there. Um, but with that comes a lot of toxic behaviors um, also. So people may sometimes interpret some of these behaviors um, as cour courageous, but it's actually not. So look out for people that you think that may be courageous how they speak with others. Do they do so with disdain? Are they bombastic? Are they bullying? Um, so look out for cynicism um, or extreme cynicism. Look out for psychopathy and narcissism. So um, when people mislabel courage, uh, it, you, can, you can observe that in the toxic behaviors. Um, when we do not have enough courage, again, that's a, that's a possibility. When there's too little courage, we'll see and notice on the behaviors of people avoiding conflict. Um, there's some snarky gossip. Again, uh, look out for that passive aggressive uh, behaviors and comments, the eye rolls uh, that you may see. Um, there's also uh, very clear indications of people working behind someone else's back. Um, you also see a faceless bureaucracy. Um, one of the uh, organ government organizations that I helped a few years ago um, had this specific term. Um, whenever somebody wanted something done and this business unit said, well, can you tell us the relative importance of this compared to everything else? The standard answer was the minister said so. And then when you actually went and dug in, it was more a question from the minister than an actual decree from the minister. It was really fascinating to see how that 
question got twisted around. So, and the layers in between form that faces bureaucracy. Oh, the minister said so. Look out for sabotage where uh, against the oversight uh, direction. So even in, if oversight's being asking very, in, uh, very important questions, look out for sabotage. Um, and look out for behaviors where, where the leaders display a form of courage, uh, whether it be mis mislabeled courage or true courage that Horia just explained, but you don't see it in the worker bees or the people doing the actual work. Um, and those are the types of things when there's not enough courage in the organization. When there's too much courage, you'll start seeing other types of behaviors. You'll see increased retaliation and aggravation. You'll, see, you'll, you'll notice the disharmony that prevails in the organization. Look out for maverick culture. <clears throat> that can cause quite a lot of damage to your organization. Um, and usually you'll notice that there's a breakdown of trust when there's excessive courage. And that's usually where ego plays a role. Ego also plays a role in overreacting to things. Um, so uh, people would remove the irritant, the, the, the person that scratches uh, too deeply on any of the, the things that people don't want scratched. Um, you look at public executions in a corporate sense, not uh, in a French Revolution sense, um, you'll, you'll notice that people would be hung out to dry and that is shooting the messenger, etc. So trust is replaced with control in these instances. Um, people would try and assert more control because they feel that doing that, um, it will uh, give them uh, a little bit more power for them. Then look out for anti-patterns around change. So when courage is pretty low, there's typical anti-patterns that support that uh, low courage inside that organization. So look out for uh, heroes and the, the cult of the hero in your organization. That's a real sign. So the hero may display some courageous behaviors and get away with it, but it could very quickly turn into toxic behaviors or excessive cover, uh, courage as well. Um, look at falling professional standards. Um, very simple thing to look at here that I've always go look at is how well does the definition of ready and done? How well is it adhered to? And is it done so consistently? And that's a dead giveaway that these standards are slipping. So that's another anti-pattern to potentially look out. Look out for burnout, um, people making mistake because they tired. Um, it happens, you, you, you notice people work for months and months, 12 hour days, weekends, uh, their families suffer from it, and then they start making increased mistakes. You'll notice that as well. Um, look at the H word, loss of hope. You'll notice that very clearly. And the more you try and reignite that hope and it gets... Uh, uh, um, dishonored or the hope gets dashed, the more that happens, the more hopeless you'll notice people are and the more energy it will take to get people motivated. So I call that false hope. Um, that's a real anti-pattern and it's really, really damaging to the morale and to your organization. If you constantly create false hope, you're conditioning the people in such a way that they don't believe you anymore. Trust is lost when you say, we're going to do the next thing and people are just going to go, oh, okay, well, yay. Anyway, <laughs> so um, look out for those things. Um, there's quite a lot of anti-patterns that's associated with change through the lens of courage. Now, let's look at what benefits do we retain when we have healthy, safe environment oh, yeah. mm. and that is absolutely essential because with 
a safe foundation, we can have an integrated, shared, and harmonious purpose. In other words, it's safe to be yourself at work because what you care about is valued by the people around you. Why, what you want to do is valued by the people around you. The things that matter to you are valued by the people around you, and it's safe to share that with others. You don't have to um, hide your true self. You don't have to um, show uh, any kind of um, alternative perspective. You don't have to spend energy on presenting um, a different persona that you're hoping is going to be more accepted because your true self isn't really welcome. And therefore, it's unsafe to be yourself. It's unsafe to, to show up as, a, as an integrated um, human. Um, now, having this shared purpose, in other words, we care about this thing. We really enjoy our work. We uh, have great respect for the people that we serve. And we deliver a great value. All of that <clears throat> requires fantastic teaming. So high performance teaming where people have this feeling of mutual support, where everybody has everybody else's back. When we when needed, we are reteaming smoothly as well. In other words, hey, uh, we notice that this other team requires some help. So some of us will go there and some of them will go elsewhere. We can reteam um, efficiently. Safety also reflects itself well in physical safety. It's, it's not risky to be at work. Um, the work environment is safe. And here I should draw attention to, in the safety literature, we talk about two flavors of safety, safety one and safety two, uh, kind of Roman numeral one and two. So safety one is the typical, uh, let's call it um, air crash investigation safety, where uh, an incident happens, whoops, and then some inspectors go in, we investigate, we determine what the root causes are, we um, figure out some countermeasures, we apply the countermeasures, we look for what happens when things go wrong, and then we repair them. Um, now, this contributes over time to improving safety. But safety too is about how do we look at rapid adaptation? And we learn about safety too, for instance, by looking at what happens when an unintended situation has happened and we notice how did people self-organize? How do they react to cope with that? Yeah. So safety too is much more about learning how to anticipate potential challenges and how to react and how to become anti-fragile over time. So being accustomed with safety can promote better uh, physical safety as well. Now, I alluded already to, to trust and the necessity of trust. For having any kind of um, performance as a team, you need to be able to trust one another right? You need to have it so that it's safe to disagree. Um, so when uh, we, we practice safety well, we don't do so in a punitive fashion. We do so in a supportive fashion. We see the initiative and the oversight function as partners rather than enemies, right? Now, social safety uh, has, a, has a focus on thriving as a community in the long run. We're not just looking for the next month or the next quarter. Um, let's make a bonus and, and cut and run. Yeah. So um, this also refers to that strength-based um, improvement, the safety too, that um, I was mentioning. In other words, we take stock of what are the things that we are really good at and how can we take advantage of that in order to become safer in our environment as opposed to um, blindly following some um, routine specification on the hope that it may well be sufficiently applicable in our context as well, right? And finally, um, a, an essential aspect of safety done really well is how the oversight function receives news. Notice here, I'm not calling it bad news or good news. We're essentially saying, 
as an oversight function, you're learning from the bad news and you're celebrating good news. You may see in some organizations, people make a fail wall and we make a bit of a, of a fun um, event out of actually celebrating in some way. Well, it's not really a celebration. It's more of a, um, let's learn to, to laugh at our um, mishaps, right? Let's learn to use humor in a constructive fashion, right? Let, let's learn to creatively self-deprecate and say, ha, huh, look what we just went and did, damn it. <laughs> Yeah. So rather than having a feeling of, oh, oh, we're so ashamed. Oh, we can't afford to have anybody else know about this. Ah, it's too painful. Instead of that, you go, damn it. See, we did this. Duh. <laughs> okay. How do we learn from this? How do we uh, do better? Right. So um, ensuring that no bad news stays hidden. It has to be safe to poke fun at ourselves. Right. Okay, so with that, let's have a peek at what do we want to have happen? What's our overall hope, our overall uh, purpose of integrating well, safety and courage? I'll do it. So I'd like to talk about when there's balance between safety and courage, and we don't have the downsides. What we notice is that organizations tend to have wisdom, lots of cognitive freedom. Um, they live their ikigai and uh, there's lots of um, healthy habits around kaizen and kaikaku and I'll explain what those are. Um, <clears throat> when it comes to wisdom, um, some aspects of that um, uh, you'll notice is that uh, on the behaviors and the principles is like some things like insights need transparency. So people will actively go and seek insights and actively make information available, even if it is uh, the bad news that Horia spoke about, um, they actually go out and seek that information so that they can generate insights. And that's a form of wisdom. Um, there, are, um, there are certain things uh, at, that builds on that uh, building wisdom needs discipline and effort and patience so you'll notice um, wisdom building or insight creation in the organization is a systematic process it is method uh, it, it, it is systematic and people actively go out and build this behaviors into everything that they do um, there are meaningful standards, not just blind uh, bureaucratic rules. Um, there are meaningful standards and people actually understand the value that those things bring. People understand the wisdom that an oversight capability or function provides to the organization and to initiatives. I like to talk about cognitive freedom and the best way to summarize that for me is about um, celebrating an idea meritocracy. So ideas are challenged, ideas are discussed and not people. People don't have the reason to become defensive. So there's that cognitive freedom um, where, uh, when it comes to uh, exploring new ideas or exploring change uh, and so on. So, and you'll see some parts of that is you're not leaving people behind. When you bring a change, you bring everybody along on the change and you don't do the change at them. Um, there is deep knowledge on how to deal with diversity in your organization and how change affects people in different ways. Um, you looking for opportunities to unleash everyone's potential and you're very aware, you do a risk analysis uh, of the consequences. You're very aware of the consequences if you make a change instead of just blindly doing so because some consultancy told you to do so. Um, You'll see a lot of grace around that. So Horia spoke about that again, when you make mistakes, it requires quite a lot of grace with yourself as well um, and, and patience with yourself. 
to um, accept that you made a mistake. You're not as, as, as Superman as you thought you would be, uh, and so on. Um, next one is Ikigai, and Ikigai is that uh, term that means that um, you're good at something that you're being paid for that uh, society needs, and um, that's... Uh, that you love doing. That you love doing. And you'll see an organization living its ikigai. You'll see the people living their own ikigais inside that specific context. And um, there are uh, lots of uh, behaviors around that. Look at uh, focus on psychological flow and achieving meaning. So when you look at Maslow's hierarchy, what is the organization doing in for everybody in the organization to meet its self-actualization? Um, do really well what you love doing uh, that the world needs and then you can get paid for. That's an ikigai. Um, and maybe uh, look at uh, elements of entrepreneurship and catalyst behaviors. Uh, not only inside the organization, but perhaps into the industry as well. Now, Kaizen, we spoke about Kaizen before. That's basically, uh, and I know Horia is going to give me a look here. It's basically a continuous improvement. But Kaikaku is where Kaizen is about small incremental improvements. Kaikaku is about big shifts or a big improvement that can be quite disruptive. Now, it's really interesting to observe how organizations behave when there are big uh, changes or small changes happening. Um, and it gives quite a lot of way about their culture. Now, what we're looking for is when we have balance in safety and courage, um, you'll notice that in, in Kaizen and Kaikaku, you'll notice a sense of change is a friend it's not a foe so people embrace change instead of try and resist it and incidentally uh, lots of people have written about this um, and i've seen this as well in organizations it's not the change that people resist is how the change is brought about how the change is done to them that they resist um, so notice how you manage that change if it does not necessarily include people, invite information from them or invite contributions, you may um, end up in an adversarial position. Other um, uh, elements when it comes to making changes, um, we'll notice that risk taking is balanced. So we are taking, uh, we're making a change, but we have assessed the risks for it. So there's real discipline around risk assessment when you make changes. You'll notice also a culture of continuous learning, people learning together, people uh, finding information and bringing it back into the tribe or into the organization. People actively are continuously going out there and finding their information. Um, there's also uh, a, 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 quite a good um, skill to kill when we uh, organizations that's really good at this knows exactly when a change has not worked um, and they would kill it off and go and try another another way to affect the outcomes that they hoped for. Other parts of Kaizen and Kakaku is also organizations not afraid to continuously innovate their products, even kill product lines in favor of adding new product, uh, product lines. Um, also, we notice that standards are changeable and revisable. It's not poured in concrete or uh, in two stone tablets and given on a mountain somewhere in history. It's actually malleable. It changes as the context changes, but it's done so in a disciplined way. Um, people accept that change is the new normal, and then they, they accept that the way they've worked two years ago may not be relevant anymore, and they embrace those types of adjustments that happens. You'll notice faster learning curves um, that bring new or junior people up, up to speed. 
um, inside the organization instead of behaviors that keeps them in the dark, instead of behaviors of uh, job uh, protection and so on. And then very lastly, there's a lonely note there at the bottom, respectful conversations with power. So when we have balance here is you'll notice the way in which conversations happen between the high powered and the low powered or the big power gradient, uh, people with bigger, uh, 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 you get the idea. You'll notice that there is the respect uh, of the conversations are both ways. Um, uh, so that, that, that's quite interesting. Now, looking at the what are both sides trying to avoid? Why would people fall into those bad habits? Is what is it that they're trying to avoid? What is the fear that they are trying to allay? Korea. Well, um, this has to do with what happens when it's unsafe. And therefore, we're on our toes. We're always on the defensive. Um, uh, we are engaged in indecisiveness. We're not sure what to do. We practice willful blindness. We pretend not to see. Um, we also um, hide behind perfectionism, right? Uh, and say, no, 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 it's not quite ready. We need to do some more, some more, some more work, but then nothing really much gets achieved. Um, now, there's also um, a good enoughism in this context, essentially says, uh, yeah, whatever we have right now, it's, it's comfy enough, we don't have to, to improve it. And we're going to actively discourage people from, from challenging what we have. I mean, if you think about it, humanity has had long stretches of time where things have hardly ever changed. And the power structures that we've had have actively discouraged any kind of heretical thought, right? I mean, that means essentially thought that diverges from the orthodoxy, the right way of saying things, of thinking of things. There's a right way of thinking and everything else is heresy. So that then makes us unsure. There's all sorts of corruption and organizational decay. When we embrace dogma and we are intolerant of anything but the dogma and there's a compliance police and there's extremism and factionalism and all sorts of self-entitlement and uh, we mentioned here second class hires third class, meaning um, you're not really interested in um, good competence you know you're not all that competent, you're second class in terms of competence because you can't really be bothered. So therefore you surround yourself because you're afraid and you're not feeling particularly safe with even worse, even less competent uh, minions that kind of stoke your, your ego. And to a large extent, that's why um, the communism experiment has, has failed so miserably. Right? Because the upper echelons of um, society were not at all based on any kind of competence, but rather this kind of corruption and organizational decay and nepotism and, and uh, whatnot, right? factionalism. So uh, fraud and distrust and uh, other things kind of um, come into play. Also, uh, when... Uh, things don't happen well, then there's all sorts of loss happening because the more we're trying to hide things, the more we're making it unsafe uh, for people, the more we're going to lose good people because they're not going to be able to, um, to sustain this kind of death of the soul, doing things that are unconscionable. Some people might uh, go to jail, uh, some people might lose income, there might be all sorts of 
disrespect um, happening. There's a uh, fear of speaking truth to power and therefore um, things don't get to improve. Um, there's also lots of difficulty around emotional and mental atrophy because we humans are, are built for struggle. We, we're, we're really thriving when we have something to, to struggle against. Uh, most of us have some form of, of calling. We're so fascinated by stories. And in stories, we love the stories where the, um, the protagonist overcomes massive difficulty. And that's the thing, the, the struggle, the overcoming. Yeah? Yes, there are some time, uh, some relaxing stories of slice of life, a little bit a day in the life of such and such. Yeah, from time to time, yes, those stories have some, some interest. But by and large, most of the stories that, uh, that capture our imaginations are ones of, of conflict and drama and, and tension that gets resolved in some way. And that requires, again, a balance of practicing courage in the pursuit of making things safer, better. Um, so when we're only having this leader follower mindset to say, okay, I'm just going to sit here in my, in my corner. I'm just going to wait to be told what to do. And whether it works or not, hey, I'm safe here. That's not really safety. Um, it's willful blindness, not really challenging how things might be better. Uh, learned helplessness. This is another uh, really insidious um, psychological habit where uh, we tried to make improvements and uh, they didn't quite pan out. So, hey, what's the use of even trying? This is really, really hard. It's very easy to fall into, into de uh, depression. Um, make yourself small, make sure you don't get noticed. Yeah. So when things are unsafe and um, we get engaged in habitual worsening, well, there's only so much that things can worsen until it gets too much and something will break and collapse is going to happen. Now, such is the nature of um, humanity and society. There are cycles of renewal, birth, development, and then decay, corruption, and collapse. But in that collapse, there are all the opportunities, the seeds for new development, new renewal and growth and, and development. So what we're hoping with considering all of these fears to be avoided is how do we overcome this kind of really dystopian um, possibility and how do we replace it with instead what we captured earlier and the answer lies in a fair amount of really useful actions and skills that we could practice and it's not never just a single practice it's usually a good combination of these practices okay so the first one is uh we um, have been exposed uh, in the last year or so to the work of David Mulcahy. And if you do have the time to go and immerse yourself in his work, it's really useful to help you uh, create a culture of safety and courage and create a, a safe environment for people to take courage in order to speak truth to power. Um, there's uh, quite a lot written about that. In addition to that, there's quite some, uh, a few things that you can go and explore. The first one is when you do need to have sessions or when you do need to look at improvements, look at getting professional facilitation around that. Um, you'll notice that good facilitators are the ones that deliberately work uh, divergence and convergence and they will uh, around ideas. If you don't know what convergence, divergence and convergence is, is when you have a conversation, you try uh, to divert as much as possible to get as many ideas as possible. Once we feel we've exhausted that, a good facilitator would know instinctively when to start converging it to a specific point to one or two choices that you could to, uh, that you can do. 
Also notice about this professional facilitation, how much balance do they keep in airtime? Who are they allowing to speak the most? Um, or are they giving equal voice to, to everybody? So there's quite a lot of facilitation tools and skills that you can consider that can help you build safety and courage in a specific conversation or series of conversations. Look at having performance management in your organizations to actually support safety and courage or build, build that balance. Um, start using a different language, growth mindset. David Marquet is also a really big supporter of the type of language that you use. Notice how you ask questions. Notice um, how you uh, talk about uh, ideas and things. It's really uh, uh, an eye opener when you start to look at the implications of changing your language as a basis for changing some of the, the, the culture. Um, look at mentoring programs, look at building atomic habits. If you haven't heard about that, um, there's quite a lot of interesting uh, techniques in there that you can go and apply at your, your personal level as well as at the team level. Celebrate your learning. Um, and then keep focus on the value we create for our customers and not the, the people at head office. We're not working for the people at head office. We're working for the customers that buys our products and services. Um, first, first class, highest first class, that's that, uh, uh, the antithesis to what Horia spoke about in the previous bit, but it is really about building a high performing uh, or a, a, a creating the opportunity for people to uh, um, be amongst other people that uh, challenges them in a positive way. Look for ways in which you can bring in discipline diffusion. Um, there are uh, things like pair work, so you 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 master skills and build trust through actually doing pair work, or mobbing uh, is another one, or as um, swarming is another one that you can go and think create opportunities for that to happen. Um, look at uh, if your leaders are, are uh, in there. Look at letting them to recognize uh, to fly air cover for new or weaker employees, or if there's employees with known weaknesses and other strengths, um, provide air cover for those types of things uh, from a leadership perspective. Invest in professional coaching. And this is not me selling my coaching skills or Harry's coaching skills. We do see the benefits of having professional coaching. There's quite a number of frameworks out there. The framework that I got qualified in was the results coaching framework from the Neuro Leadership Institute. And it's opened a whole new world for me when I studied it. Um, I did not know that you can have conversations in those ways. Um, it taught me quite a lot of skills to make it safe to explore the, the subjects and get out of the way of the person. It's their journey. Um, provide coaching training for leadership. Um, that's really a, a good skill to have is to build coaching skills in your leadership or your, your management. We look at ideas for open dialogue, uh, for promoting dialogue, um, or to have dialogue in a safe and courageous way. Um, look at the work uh, around crucial conversations that was done. Look at the ladder of leadership, another David Mulcahy um, uh, uh, method or technique that you can use, which is quite useful. Um, Radical Candor from Kim Scott, um, his fantastic um, uh, tools, techniques and approaches that you can take in order to actually have courageous conversations in a safe way. Um, build respect. Um, there is a I intend to, uh, that's part of the ladder of leadership. Uh, and, and it's really a valuable skill set to go and look at what a ladder of leadership can give you for having really good dialogue. Cultivate experimentation. Um, I worked with a customer 
a number of years ago and didn't know that there was an allergic reaction to the word experiments. And I was talking about experiments and I got immediate kickback from, uh, from that. So notice the language that you use. Um, but in uh, although, of, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Um, for our listeners, getting immediate kickback doesn't mean you got some money. Ah, okay. Because <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> the term kickback may also refer to getting a bribe of some sort. <laughs> uh, no, I, I mean the donkey kick, you know, you, you get a donkey kick to the face. Right. Um, it's, maybe it's another South Africanism. So, <laughs> okay. So uh, in terms of, uh, th th that's what I mean, uh, is that you got a kick in the face because you yeah. used the wrong word that you didn't know. Um, but when you cultivate experimentation, um, make sure that your messengers feel safe uh, when people uh, do bring a message. Um, there's a lot of ideas in order to get ideas about experiments um, and get people to actually understand the blast radius of those experiments, manage the risk uh, around those experiments, um, cultivate uh, things like an apprentice uh, mindset, um, do betting, cultivate those loon shots, um, have innovation days, have innovation time. I had a customer that made it a rule that one day of every sprint they are supposed to spend on that sprint um, on non-delivery work. And that could be work to improve their ways of working, i.e. Kaizen uh, work, or to go and explore new technology or new tools that they could potentially use in the con uh, concept. Uh, FedEx days, all sorts of things like that will supports this culture of cultivating experimentation. Um, then look at cultivating well-being in people, especially the ones that find it difficult to be courageous, or especially the ones that comes from a different culture, um, that uh, courage was not appreciated, and they come into your culture. Um, give them uh, enough tools to cope with that change. Um, also make it fun. So um, look at, I uh, see this supply nerve guns. Um, so nerve guns is a, is a little gun that, that shoots uh, uh, foam, uh, foam bullets at, at other people. And, but make it fun. Um, cultivate altruism and then the same, same scenes punish narcissism. Yes, Aurea. Uh, to describe the idea of Nerf guns and why Nerf guns are a good idea, right? We're, we're not suggesting that we promote violence. We're simply <laughs> suggesting uh, that we practice the courage to shoot down bullshit. Uh, that's how I've used the, the Nerf gun. I supplied a product owner with, uh, with a Nerf gun and instructed her, uh, as soon as people start to give you bullshit, shoot them. <laughs> Right. And very rapidly, the, the level of bullshit rapidly decreased in that team and the level of, of fun and, and professionalism and really genuine achievement skyrocketed. So um, this is an example where this simulacrum of violence led to dramatic improvement. So we were courageous enough to say, you know what? No, we're not going to tolerate this anymore. And it was safe and people didn't feel offended or oh, somehow um, um, aggravated by engaging in this play. Very good. Thanks for, um, for that as well, Horia. Um, okay. Uh, other things to, to consider is uh, look at building in good and healthy habits around pastoral care for the people working um, and then find ways to do ongoing teaching and reinforcement about psychological safety. And very important, leave egos at the door. Check your ego here. Um, check your ego in here. Now, those are quite a lot of ideas. Um, when you look at the actual video, the, it's, it's on there. You can take a screenshot probably of that. Um, but there's quite a lot of ideas in which you can go and create balance in safety and courage in your context. 
Let's look at what are the warning signs we need to look out for when safety and courage becomes imbalanced. Oria. Right. So in terms of focusing our attention, what should we keep an eye out for? What should we notice? Well, you see a huge cluster around language how people use language. And that's good news because as a, as a leader, as a, a professional, as a practitioner, most of us will be able to listen to conversations. And even if you're somewhat hearing impaired, you will have some means of communication. You will have some means of engaging in connection in, in communication. And you notice the intention of that communication. You notice how people use language, what tone do they use? What's the implication of that language? What do people do with language? Do they engage in blaming and shaming? Do they engage in, how do I put this? Um, attempts at indoctrination. Right? Um, do they um, use euphemisms? Um, do they use all sorts of coercive language? Do they use all sorts of evasive language or manipulative language? This is where I would draw your attention to the works of Robert Greene. He has some fantastic titles that are really insightful in the shadow aspects of our psychology, right? So language can give us all sorts of clues as to how do we practice courage? How do we engage with safety? What's in your mind, Al? There's one thing that says we don't fail here. Um, mm -hmm. It triggers a, a, something that happened to me some months ago is I went for an interview with an organization um, uh, and uh, they asked me for explaining two situations uh, that I had to deal with and I used one of the um, situations um, to explain and I thought I'm showing courage by explaining um, where I failed uh, in um, in doing something um, and I couldn't really um, uh, deal with that, not, not deal, I, could, I failed as a coach in a specific situation and the feedback I got after the interview was the organization said that uh, basically we don't fail here, our coaches never fail. Um, so I took the courage to, <laughs> <laughs> I took the courage to explain um, where I failed uh, in, in the coaching. And um, that was the message I got back. So the view I got, uh, the language that they used is that uh, it's not a very safe organization to fail in uh, when you work for them. It's quite yeah. fascinating. Sorry, that just um, jumped out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that, that's, that's fantastic. Um, which brings to mind uh, a, a somewhat similar situation that I've encountered. Uh, where the people that I was uh, speaking with explained to me that no, in their organization, it's not safe to challenge uh, the people in position of authority. So no, they felt that I would be a risk uh, to them because they got the gist that I will speak truth to power no matter what. I'm accustomed to to practicing courage. So they said, mate, you're 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 too out there. <laughs> no, we we can't work with you. <laughs> <laughs> you're you're too much of a straight shooter right and it's 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 messages like that that gives you real warning signs that uh, safety and courage um, is not really practiced um, so what and then that was just in the verbal communication so have a look out for that Sorry, yeah. Maria, you can continue. no no it's perfectly fine um, now emotion on the one hand we see language um, another more subtle way of noticing is emotion. We're so accustomed 
in the world of work to logic. Work should be intellectual. And in various ways, we're hinting to each other that no, 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 emotions should, uh, should be left at the door. We shouldn't take things personally. We shouldn't bring emotion into the workplace. Um, we should essentially, if uh, people are familiar with uh, science fiction um, and the, the Star Trek universe, we should be Vulcans. Vulcans are this um, alien uh, humanoid species that pride themselves on, on logic and intellect only. And um, yeah, they live long and prosper. Uh, that's right. Uh, the um, idea being that somehow there's great merit in only engaging logic. Now, reality makes it so that humans are not just beings of logic. We're also uh, beings of emotion and we're also beings of spirit so blending all of these things together and noticing um, how do we feel about things are people afraid are people suffering from from trauma well this happens and uh, these days we more readily acknowledge um, concepts such as post-traumatic stress disorder it's actively recognized and a lot of people forget that 50, 60 years ago, such a thing was not openly considered. In the uh, world wars, people started speaking of people being shell-shocked. Right? So the beginnings of understanding the human psyche and its, its reaction to, to trauma uh, we're there because, hey, we're all human. We have the same kind of biological and emotional makeup. Our collective subconscious and unconscious are shared. So therefore, most of us react in very similar ways. Um, therefore, we need to be mindful of what's happening with our emotions. This is where, for instance, in recent years, many of the um, better legal firms have ceased hiring just for IQ. They had started screening applicants for emotional intelligence and relationship intelligence. In other words, you don't just want somebody who is clever. You want somebody that is intellectually clever, but also is a person that reads emotions in others and can connect well with others and form good social bonds as opposed to alienating everybody by displaying behaviors that are careless of others emotions right so you want to be able to form rapport you want to be able to develop good connection with people hey you need to notice emotion and manage emotion in yourself and in relation to to others right we speak here of positivity ratio, right? Um, see the work of Barbara Fredrickson. Uh, positivity ratio is how many good interactions do you have versus uh, an, an unpleasant or negative um, action. Yeah. So what you want to have for your organization to thrive, Barbara's research suggests that a positivity ratio of three to one or better tends to indicate a really a good likelihood of the organization thriving. Otherwise, we may have various degrees of struggle. Now, uh, understanding also how to practice neutrality, right? Um, Trevor Moad has some, some really interesting work in this space. In other words, when the situation around us doesn't give us a lot of opportunity to, hey, pretend to celebrate because there's not much to celebrate. How do we cultivate neutrality? In other words, how can we reset our emotional state to one of neutrality? In other words, rather than falling prey to depression and saying to oneself, oh, this didn't work and that didn't work and uh, why even bother? Yeah, rather than um, losing hope, when you reset to a state of neutrality, you go, okay, so next and next 
and next. Now you see this in sports in particular, where you make an attempt um, at scoring and it fails. And rather than engaging in severely negative reprimands and, um, and kicking yourself for it, you reset to a neutral stance and you become effective at go for the next one and the next one and the next yeah. one. Yeah, those thoughts are called ants or two negative thoughts. That's right. So, um, it's quite, stamp out your ants. That's right, that's right. Yeah. And that's not to say we suggest cruelty to animals or insects <laughs> or anything like that. It's just a metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Now, um, another really interesting source of information, uh, of, of warning signs of safety and courage is the, the quality of conflict. Why I say the quality of conflict is because what we want in organizations that thrive, that improve, is we actively want conflict. We want creative, generative conflict. We want to have innovation conflict. And innovation comes from doing things that are a little bit different. In other words, we don't just go ahead with no conflict whatsoever. We just fall into line with how we've always done. We have a little bit of conflict say, but what if we did this a little bit differently? So there has to be some conflict as Adam Grant um, calls it. Uh, there's great benefit in cultivating a challenge network. Have some people that you actively take your ideas to and say, what am I missing? What's wrong with this? get them to challenge it. And that conflict is what gets you to better as opposed to ah, whatever. Yeah. The likelihood that our first idea is the best idea is close to nil. Yeah. Okay. You had something on your mind, Aldo? Um, no, I uh, was thinking that we uh, are getting close to the end of today's session. That's uh, right. So, so the last bit um, around warning sign has to do with guerrilla uh, behaviors, right? Where there are all sorts of superhero syndromes, people are hiding from the boss, there's all sorts of hero worships and various forms of normalized dysfunction. Um, yeah, guerrilla habits about, uh, are abundant uh, if you know where and, and how to look. So um, in a nutshell, I would say safety and courage are absolutely essential. I warmly encourage you to study more, practice a little bit more in this space, and by all means, reach out to us, share with us your stories, and if you want to um, express your courage by putting your hand up for being interviewed by all means please do so Maybe remember we'll... it's it's safe to do here at the focus um we're, we're quite uh, happy to get your war stories um and tell us what we've missed um, so thank you um, so that's wrapping it up for today and our next episode we'll be in we'll we'll start some of our interviews um, and I'm really looking forward to introducing our next, uh, our first interviewer, interviewee uh, in our next episode. So keep an eye out for that. Um, this is The Focus. I'm Aldo Roll. And I'm Horia Sloshansky. See you next time.